went from just identifying the general air, the the general characteristics of each of our cities to the zoning map. So the zoning map will hopefully give you a bit more clarity as to what's going on in your city, barangay, or municipality, and might even explain some of the issues that your um, area is uh, experiencing. For example, if your area is like uh, Barangay Santo Nino over here, where it's like mostly commercial and no residential areas, that might explain why it's kind of almost always empty, like after work hours. That's why it's very unsafe past 6 p.m. and like uh, because nobody lives in this area and then the people who do are those who are like either um, homeless because there's no residential areas here or they live on the street so that makes it like a bit uh, unsafe and like uh, even some would say like uh, this becomes an area of na matulis jidka even though this is supposed to be where our two oldest churches are in Cebu City. We have um, Bar uh, Basilica del Santo Nino and um, what do you call this? Uh, the cathedral over here. Also, it's the area for our city hall. So it's very kanang, um, ironic that sort of the, the center or like where our seat of government is, or it could be very apt. that It's also the most dangerous place uh, in Cebu City, depending on your perspective. So this is why we're doing um, this activity. And sort of connecting it with what we discussed last week, uh, let me just open it here. That the very first step in urban planning is really identifying your stakeholders. And in this case, the stakeholder is the city. So uh, in architecture, you're designing for uh, one client, but in um, urban planning, you're designing for the people in the city. So that's why it's a, mo a lot more complex um, some would say too complex and that's why the projects tend to be uh what they call this uh tend to have longer development because ideally they would need like uh engagement with the public and if they don't engage with the public just create a project right away there's a very big chance now the public will reject that project and other things like um people won't like it they won't use it so that becomes a excuse me uh, urban planning failure so that's why for me, uh, how I was like taught in uh, Sydney, um, public engagement is very important. Okay, so uh, just a quick show here. Uh, last semester we had like an essay because there were like a lot less students and we were like 25 or something. But still that took a lot of time to read and I made, I made the mistake of making it like a whole page essay. But the takeaways from your predecessors were like after we did the planning discussion, like the introduction to planning, uh, the urban planning process, uh, they, they decided, um, they took away that planning is a process to make sure that each person enjoys the full potential of, the, of urbanization and progress. So like equity, uh, making sure everyone enjoys the benefits of the development of the city. Um, Urban planning is the solution to urban design or like urban development. A good plan will always result in good design. So um, I took note here that these ideas are a bit problematic because they're very kind of, they put uh, urban planning on a very high pedestal where in reality, urban planners can only uh, attempt or estimate uh, what the outcome of design will be. And then there is really this thing, uh, if you have a degree in urban planning, that you know everything, but you, you we're not like omnipotent. So a good urban planner is one who is sensitive to the people's needs and has a good idea of the processes and the, what they call this, the stakeholders and how to appease each stakeholder to create a design that will work. Okay, as a review, in Cebu City, everyone's driven fast. The city is crowded, uncomfortable. In Cagayan de Oro, there are no bike lanes. So this is, this is just them talking about, because um, we had a few students from Cagayan de Oro, and talking about the problems in their cities, which uh, you did uh, last week. So uh, looking at living conditions in other countries, uh, let's take a quick Google search of Singapore, Indonesia, and then what is livability? So I have this. I've been like wanting to talk about this for a while now. So what is livability? It's the sum of the factors that add up to a community's quality of life. Basically, it's a new-ish, new maybe like from the past five years or 10 years, 
uh, way to measure the quality of life in cities. So if you, if you Google most livable cities in the world, back in uh, 2019, or no, this was early 2020, the li most livable cities would have been, uh, wait, this is, let me see, where is this? 2018, I Googled this like uh, last year, but the ranking is based off data from 2018. Number one most livable city in the world would have been Vienna. So that's here in Europe. Number two is Melbourne, Australia. And then uh, three, Osaka, Japan, and et cetera, and et cetera. So notice uh, these cities are, um, what do you call this? One is in Europe, one is in Australia. So they're all over the place. There's, the, there's no like um, sort of hub for livable cities. But what about the least livable cities? They tend to gather together, uh, mostly in Africa. So you have um, 135 Harare, this is South Africa, 138 is Lagos, and 140 Damascus, that's like uh, north of Saudi Arabia. And then you also have 139 Dhaka, that is like east of India. Uh, thankfully, like Philippines is not here, but um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to improve. We're like, I think, a little bit better than these, like somewhere in the middle. And then if you look at updated data, updated data on livable cities. So I have it here. So let's see. Let me just skip to the results here. Oh, this is talking about the, how they are, um, how, does it, how do you measure livability? So you can check this out it's on my Facebook page over here. So global livability, uh, most livable cities, most cities in the world, 2021. And then it seems like it hasn't changed at all. So once it, there's also this thing that once the infrastructure is in place, um, the quality of that system, um, the infrastructure, the streets, the buildings, the uh, zoning, the codes, tend to be uh, sustainable. So livability is also equal or similar to sustainability. So number one in 2021 is Auckland, New Zealand, Osaka, Japan again, Adelaide, Australia, Wellington, New Zealand, and then Tokyo, Japan. So this time livable cities, according to uh, AUG Student Services, is now more uh, is located in New Zealand, Australia, and Japan, and then a bunch in Switzerland, and then the rest are in Australia. So they tend to be, um, they're becoming more and more sort of centered or like uh, located in similar cities now, probably because of how they deal with uh, COVID-19, whereas back in 2018, it's more spread out. But really, uh, because of the pandemic, uh, most cities in this list in 2018 couldn't cope. That's why other cities have like overtaken them in terms of uh, livability. So this is really why we're analyzing our population data, analyzing our cities, and looking at zoning to see what's going on in the city. And these could like um, present some indications as to how and why uh, we're having so and so problems. And like it could also be indicators of like. What could be opportunities for our cities, uh, barangays, and municipalities um, to improve? Okay, so just hammering it again, uh, repeating it, um, this time in more simpler terms. Urban planners, what do they do? What do they make? Uh, urban planners work with policy that shape urban development. For example, uh, planners can write policies and recommendations, and you can also uh, see these in our like zoning maps. So this is the typical output of uh, urban planners, urban and regional planners. Meanwhile, as we talked about last week, uh, urban designers uh, work with the physical form of cities, what we mentioned, the space between buildings. So an urban designer can be working on uh, make, uh, designing streetscapes and major transportation corridors, parks, open space, waterfronts, plazas, etc. Even uh, architectural design guidelines for neighborhoods and uh, downtowns. So we're, th we're talking about public space when we say urban design. And in urban planning, we're talking about policy and uh, resource management. So that's something to really like differentiate urban planning and urban design. Okay, so who are the stakeholders? Again, it's any person or group that will be impacted either positively or negatively by your project, urban planning project. 
And then site, I'm, uh, we're all familiar with this, site planning. Uh, we did this last sem, so I'm not going to discuss too much on that. Let me just check the time. 4.54, okay. So what I stumbled upon yesterday evening, uh, I was looking for things we could talk about today, is this very cool like uh, interactive map showing um, population changes uh, in Manila and Cebu. I think there are some for other barangays. Uh, so if you click here on the Philippines tab, and then I think there are Mindanao, Luzon, and Visayas. Um, for cities, these are the different cities they have. Uh, Cebu, Cotabato. So if your your city and your uh, municipality is on this list, you might be able to look at it. For that person in uh, Qatar, Doha, I think you're definitely your city is definitely on here because this is not just for the Philippines, but an international sort of free publication of uh, maps, interactive maps and charts. So let's go back to uh, Central or Barangay Santo Nino. A, B, C, D here. And then let's look at something. Like, let me just do this. OK. And then do this. Can everyone see clearly, by the way? Sorry, I didn't check. I didn't mic check at the start of the video. Yes, sir, we can. OK, thank you. Oops, it's done processing. So I can just save that. OK. So um, from uh, the project I'm currently working on is in uh, Barangay Santo Nino, AKA uh, Central, is uh, like trying to improve the pedestrian access to uh, what they call this, the Basilica del Santo Nino. So just looking over here at the zoning map, uh, very evident that uh, Barangay Central or Barangay Santo Nino has almost like maybe less than 5% residential areas. So it makes sense that over here, where did, where did I go again? I need to put that there. This is a uh, density map. So let me just show the legend. So the legend, so in purple is the most dense and green is the least dense. So it's somewhere here in the uh, 25,000 persons per square kilometer, so somewhere in the middle. The most dense areas in Cebu City are in over here, Pasil and uh, Suba Poblacion, and then uh, Lorega. So these are the most dense. But notice when I look at um, the actual population numbers, where are the most people located, are located in Cebu City? They're in Barangay Guadalupe. 70,000 uh, population. So let me show the legend here. Show legend. You can like go to this website and play around yourself. But I just want to highlight how people are moving away from the older districts of Cebu and up and up into the um, mountainous areas where the new developments are. So that's Barangay Guadalupe followed by, let's see, what's next? And there's there's no sixty thousand population. The next like large population is forty five thousand or forty thousand. That's Lahug. Uh, anything else? Lahug and maybe uh, Talamban is close. So you see that direction moving inland from the coast, and then even more interesting is the population change or the rate of change. So let me show the legend. Uh, show legend. So purple is the highest change at 30% per, uh, annually, a 30% 30, 30 increase in one year to uh, like this uh, dark blue, which is minus 5% uh, annually, or like in one year. So notice Barangay Central or Santo Nino is in the blue, meaning dark. It's at minus 8.9%. So that's how many people are have left uh, Barangay Central from um, what is this per year? Like from twenty, from two thousand five to twenty fifteen. So that's that's uh, uh, ten years. Uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, at rate of change over ten years, so you can see it's declining, declining, declining. However, if you look at areas like um, over here, Budlaan, eleven percent change. That means like an eleven percent increase from 2005 probably the this most surprising like increase of uh, population in cebu cities i didn't think 
people will be moving there. So there's a lot of probably new developments over there. Also, big uh, another big change here is like 6.3% uh, Barangay Babag, Pulang Bato. So more here on the northern areas. Even Guadalupe, which had the highest population, didn't change much. Probably because it's like nearing the maximum capacity of like how many people can live here. Whereas in the older areas of Cebu City, they already reached their max. And then because they were so full back in the day, like early 90s, people didn't want to live there anymore. And the new subdivisions popping up in Guadalupe, Lahug, Talamban were more attractive. And that caused that sort of like um, this uh, urban flight or they, they're they leaving the center for more uh, comfortable like living conditions in the northern areas or inland. And then after uh, a decade, we're already feeling the effects of that migration from like central to um, the northern parts of uh, Cebu, where the effect which is uh, traffic congestion. So if the, let me just increase the transparency a bit. So you see here, most of the population change is over here and they need to go through, especially this is Talamban, sorry. And then if you live in Talamban, usually you would work somewhere in the city or if you go to like Banilad or if you need to go to Ayala, that's really the only way you can, that's the fastest way you can get to Ayala or like uh, the center. Yeah, otherwise, you have to take a detour down this road over here, which just uh, like increases your travel time significantly, makes it uh, less comfortable for people. And then if you live in Guadalupe, all of our commercial areas, going back to our zoning map over here, um, let's make a, let's take a Cebu City zoning map, Cebu City zoning map. Do, 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 do. Okay. So it's an older version of zoning map. Notice how our residential areas are all the way in, inland, like several kilometers inland, and our commercial areas are all like uh, stuck together near the older districts of Cebu. So already this kind of development pattern is uh, just like waiting for traffic congestion <laughs> is a very bad, what they call this, um, setup and will lead to traffic congestion and the traffic congestion will lead to increased CO2 and all the other effects. Like more development in the mountains means like more uh, paved surface areas, so less r rainwater runoff absorption, which will lead to more flooding in the center which makes the center more, uh, what they call this, undesirable, causing more people to leave. So this is a very unsustainable uh, sort of development pattern. And I think currently Cebu City is still trying to figure out how to redevelop or how to change that pattern. So I have some examples here of uh, successful cities. Um, what is the living, I think everyone agrees that uh, Singapore is one of the most um, livable cities in the world livability rating or ranking. Singapore named the most livable location in the world. <laughs> what? It even beat, I guess it depends on which site you're looking for. Singapore wasn't even on the list. Uh, let's go back here. Was Singapore on this list? Let me close this. Percent. See Vienna, Oscar, Osaka, Calgary, Sydney, Vancouver, Toronto, Tokyo, Copenhagen, Adelaide. It's not on that list. ECA, increase, decrease, change in livability scores from 2019 to 2020. We can definitely say that uh, Singapore is up there. And uh, let's say if they're not in the top. Um, purple is their industrial areas and orange is their um, residential areas and blue are their commercial areas. So uh, the commercial areas are like, uh, what they call this, uh, sticking together closer to this uh, port area over here, but they're also peppered throughout the city. So a little bit more here on the uh, sort of like Western coast, some areas over here, if you zoom in a bit, over here in the like Western side of the country and a little bit over here in the Eastern side of the country. So it's more spread out meaning um, people have the option to uh, live closer to where they work. Whereas in Cebu City, there's really no option. Uh, it's either you live in like um, very expensive apartment buildings just on the periphery of the commercial area, or 
you live in like uh, the same amount of like uh, the same cost but uh, wider or bigger rooms in like uh, the subdivisions to the north so comparing it with Cebu City over here over here and then very interestingly uh, Singapore has a land area one of the smallest land areas uh, I think in the world for a country Singapore is only seven hundred seven hundred twenty eight uh, square kilometers where Cebu City is I think about let's see 315 square kilometers but that's just Cebu City Singapore is the whole country uh, let me double check here 315 square kilometers and Singapore is 728 so about twice the size of Cebu City but the Philippines, if you look at Philippines as a country, Philippines, the Philippines has a, uh, what do you call this, land area of da, 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 government, legislature, total land area of 200, let's just say 290,000 square kilometers. So you could fit several Singapores into the land area of the Philippines. So really it's a, uh, not just a question of the government, but also uh, a question of how the people are, how receptive are the people to the policies, um, what is the communication like. Basically, uh, what Singapore did is that it had a clear vision of like what it wanted to do, and it had open lines or like uh, very clear like communication with their st stakeholders. So the stakeholders being the private businesses, the people, the public living around this country, and then uh, what else? So private businesses, the public, uh, local uh, residences, local officials, so they can all, this all coordinated, so that's what I'm saying. So let's take a look at the liv most livable city. Let's take, uh, okay, let's just, let's use uh, Sydney. It's not in the top list, but it's like definitely up there. But notice the pattern of the development. So let me zoom in here. So uh, pink or red is their residential, blue is for business, and purple is industrial. So just looking at the whole of uh, the city of Sydney, this is basically um, the equivalent of a, uh, what do you call this? Barangay. The city of Sydney is what they call uh, the smaller Sid Sydney area. So if you, a bit of context, we need a bit of context here. So this is what the greater Sydney area looks like. So that's the whole, uh, let's say, region. Something like that. So it's a lot bigger there. And then the city of Sydney is all the way here. So this is the Sydney region or like the Sydney province and then city of Sydney is just this portion here, just this portion here. So that's what you see in this map. So I just want to highlight how much more uh, residential areas, how much land is allocated for residential areas and how it's arranged. Like, um, closer to the business districts like the commercial areas with like ample like transportation so these are uh, broken lines here like in red oranges i think these are the train lines if i'm not mistaken and roads okay so the broken lines are roads so county road proposed open space existing roads etc cetera, etc cetera. so the accessibility is a lot more kind of what they call this uh, developed meaning you can get around from one end of the city to the other whereas i think the biggest challenge in the philippines is just developing our uh, transportation infrastructure and like managing our growth so that the development doesn't overtake or overload the existing infrastructure so i think the way for um i think particularly for cebu city is just to limit development and sort of go back to the city center go back to our old districts, where they go? Our old districts over here. They have like a bigger picture of that. I oh, know I don't. 
our old districts like in Barangay Central, um, what they call this, Pasil, Ermita, San Roque, just developing these like low density areas, low population areas, so that we can like more efficiently use this land. And because there's already power, like electrical lines, water mains in this area, it will be definitely a lot cheaper than uh, developing more and more utilities up here into our like um, mountainous regions which will, of course, increase traffic congestion, also increase environmental impacts. The challenge is really coordinating with all of these like uh, uh, barangay heads, barangay representatives, and then making sure that the budget goes directly there. So that's the main challenge here. Whereas why is it so like what they call this uh, attractive for developers to develop out here is they don't need, they don't need to deal with all that engagement. That's why the, the the development for the past like decade or maybe like two decades has been, oh, let's just build on new land so we don't have to worry about all the regulations and then just build a road there. And then that's when you have the problems of traffic congestion. Sometimes these areas will have problems with the uh, power supply and water supply. And that's really um, not just uh, when government should step in, but we, we the educated um, college, uh, uh, college students, college graduates, people who know about these kinds of things, we need to like like uh, like speak up, make like uh, posts, like uh, posters, infographics, stuff like that. And even this is very useful for us because this is like provided for free, so we can use stuff like this to just like increase awareness. And then yeah.